evening. It's uh, in between uh, Christmas and New Year's, so it's uh, an exciting time, but it's an exciting time in the book of 2 Kings. So we really enjoyed the, the multiple weeks of studying Josiah, one of the best kings there were, and we enjoyed watching his reform, and it was so good. Well, Remember how good that was because it's not going to last and it's going to go downhill quickly. So we said we had come to the last five kings of the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom. They're gone. We'd come to the last five. Josiah is down and now there's four and they're going to go quickly. We're actually going to even get into chapter 24 tonight, but there's only 25 chapters in 2 Kings. So can you believe it? We're, we're, we're headed towards finishing up on it. It'll be a little bit, but nevertheless, it'll be king, 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 king. Well, tonight we're going to cover two kings because one of them is only going to be a king for three months. And then we're going to see another king and, and he's going to have a little longer time. What's going to be interesting tonight is uh, I just want to spend just a little bit of time talking about Jeremiah and his ministry with these five kings. I want to just spend a little time talking about Pharaoh Necho because he's still in it. He's still going on. And then we're actually going to see Nebuchadnezzar, his name being mentioned. He's going to come in the scene and he's going to stay in the scene because he's the king of Babylon, and eventually, within a short period of time, he is going to rule, really, the world in that part. Well, with that, tonight we're going to study Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim. So we're, we'll only have two left after we're done with these guys. But before we go any further, let's just bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, it is the rock basis of truth, Lord, and we just thank you for that, of what we believe and how we should live, but also the, the lessons that we learn from biblical history, especially how your hand works with individuals and with nations. And so, Father, would you continue to teach us those lessons, even as we apply them to our lives in our day and age. And we'll thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So uh, quickly, we'll take a look real quick at the kings of Judah and the kings of Israel. As we said before, the kings of Israel, they stopped with Hosea. And that was way back when we were discussing Ahaz. Uh, there in the southern kingdom. Well, we've gone through Hezekiah, and then we've gone through Manasseh. His name will come up again. Ammon, and then Josiah, and then his son Jehoahaz, and his other son Jehoiakim. So we're going to see these kings as they're, they're brought out. Well, let's just do a review Last week, we really did finish up with Josiah, the death of Josiah. We saw one more detailed reform. It was a reform of personal religion or personal idols. He, he destroyed the big places on the high places. He destroyed the altars. But now he went after even the personal gods and, and had another reform. 2 Kings 23, 25 says that he was indeed the greatest of the divided kings. So I, I don't think he's putting him over David because David is always the standard. But after David and these kings and the divided kingdoms, Josiah rises to the top. Um, we did hear from the prophet that it doesn't matter. Jude is still going down. But in the days of Josiah, he would be promised peace. 
And then all of a sudden we have one final event, and that's the death of Josiah, and it has to do with the Pharaoh of Egypt. The Pharaoh of Egypt is joining Assyria, and they are going to fight against Babylon around Carchemish. But in the meantime, Josiah is going to intercept him. Nico gives him a warning, which it also says he was claiming that he speaks for God. It even claimed that his warning came from the mouth of God, though we're not quite sure how to work that all out. He was a pagan. Don't know if he heard directly from God or if he heard it from a, a prophet or just what, but it turned out that he was telling the truth to, to Josiah. He said, Josiah, we don't have a problem with each other. Do not come up against me. But Josiah did. And Josiah was wounded by one of the archers, and it was a fatal wound. They took him to Jerusalem, and he died in Jerusalem. And we asked ourselves last week, well, why would he do that? Um, you know, why didn't he listen to reason when Nico said, look, we don't have anything against each other. Why, why should I have to defeat you? But we, we see that, you remember that Assyria is involved. And what did they do? Well, they just took the entire northern kingdom is what they did. And so Egypt, Nico, going to ally with Assyria. And perhaps Josiah is thinking, you know what? Better to, better to take one down now than take them both because they may be coming after me. But we do think, we do think that at the least he should have checked with a prophet. He should have inquired of the Lord. Um, but he did not, and, and, and he died. And then it says, we, we left it off with, that his son Jehoahaz became king. And so we're going to pick it up in 2 Kings chapter 23. 2 Kings chapter 23, and I, I'm going to begin with verse 30, even though we finished with verse 30. And I'm going to go eventually down to verse 33, and that'll be Jehoahaz. So we will look at him. Let me just read that real quick. 2 Kings 23, 30. His servants drove his body, that's Josiah, in a chariot from Megiddo. By the way, that's where the battle of Armageddon will be. And brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own tomb. Then the people of the land, notice the people of the land, took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in place of his father. All right, so we have some interesting things, even though there's only three verses concerning him, we have some interesting things about him. But I, I really at this time wanted to really take a look at Jeremiah for just a few things. Turn with me, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Jeremiah's ministry was a, a long-running ministry. Um, he had the ministry of all these five kings, of the five kings of the southern kingdom. He even is there when Judah falls. And he's also alive after Judah falls. And we believe that that's when he wrote Jeremiah. <clears throat> So we're only going to see three kings named in verses 1 through 3. Why? Well, two are somewhat insignificant. If I would have put all of the kings down, you would have seen that two of them were removed within a few months. And so they were very insignificant as far as their, their time goes. But let me read it. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, doesn't mention Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, 
until the exile of Jerusalem in the fifth month. So one of the things we learn here is that the rest of these kings are going to be Josiah's sons, although you wouldn't know it. <laughs> you wouldn't know it. They certainly didn't take after him. We also uh, see several other things here. Uh, it talks about his ministry. Look at verse 2. I just have to point it out because it's so important. To whom the word of the Lord came. That's what makes a prophet. You, it's not a self-appointed prophet. You don't appoint yourself to be a prophet. It is a chosen person. By the way, look at verse 5. It says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. That is what a prophet is. Someone who's appointed by God and then becomes a spokesman of God. So we see that the word of the Lord came to him. Now, as far as these five kings go, and they'll be mentioned in 2 Kings, we have Josiah. And then we have Jehoahaz, which I have him here. I should have put all of them. It's going to go so quickly. And then Je Jehoiakim. Then Jehoiachin, but he's only going to be in there for a few months. And then the reign of Zedekiah. So we're, we're going to be dealing with the, the time frame of 609 B.C., Judah is going to fall in 586 B.C. So we're really only uh, talking about several decades here until Judah falls. And, and we keep hearing the warning in 2 Kings. So this is the ministry. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is King or Pharaoh Necho. And as we go back to 2 Kings... We're going to see Pharaoh Necho mentioned in verse 33. And he's going to be mentioned in some of the other verses. Pharaoh Necho. So let's talk a little bit about him. Uh, besides, he's the one who one of his archers killed Josiah. Now, Josiah was disguised. but And so whether it was just uh, an archer shooting a random arrow, like the one that, that God Ahaz... Um, or it was, he thought he was a soldier. It's besides the point. So as we're thinking about Pharaoh of Egypt, his time was 610 to 594 BC. So he's not going to extend a period as long as Jeremiah, nor is he going to be uh, involved in the uh, demise of Judah, but he is going to uh, he is going to be around. It says, the great event of his reign was his expedition across Syria to secure for himself a share in the decaying empire of Assyria. Egypt had been tributary to Assyria. And when it began to break up, Egypt and other subject kingdoms saw their opportunity to throw off its yoke. So there was this battle. Now, just before Necho took control of Carchemish, this is the first battle of Carchemish, he encountered an undeterred Josiah at Megiddo. Though disguised, Josiah was fatally wounded in battle and died in Jerusalem. Let me mention the second battle of Carchemish. Carchemish figured in the struggle between Egypt and Babylonia uh, for the power over Syria. In 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar defeated Egypt there and Babylonia assumed control of the region. This event was a turning point in the prophecies of Jeremiah. So Jeremiah is figured in all of this. But there's something else that I found out and I thought I would share it about Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh Necho. Um, he was ambitious not only to extend his empire, but he was bent also upon the commercial development of Egypt. And so he did works there in Egypt, but also too, some of it was military. 
For this, he set himself to collect a navy. He had two fleets built composed of triremes, which had to look that up. That is an ancient ship with galley having three banks of oars. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's running on all oars of cylinders. One of them to navigate the Mediterranean and the other to navigate the Red Sea. So he's building up his navy. But it says in order to secure a combination of his fleets, he attempted the reopening of the canal between the Nile and the Red Sea, which had been originally constructed by Seti I and Ramses II, two pharaohs of the days of the Israelite oppression. So they had made uh, this navigation there between, but silt had filled in all of the years. So he begins, that is Nico, begins to work uh, on this. He excavated this old canal following the line of the former cutting and widening it so that the two triremes, these two battleships, might meet and pass each other in it. According to Herodotus, he was obliged to desist from the undertaking in consequence of the mortality among the laborers, and it was left to Darius to complete. So anyway, just something interesting about him. And he was um, a powerhouse, and he did rise to power. And we're going to see him involved in these kings. Well, now we come to verse 31, and let's talk about Jehoahaz. Now, verse 31 is going to say that he became king at 23, 23 years of age. Verse 32, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 33, he was imprisoned by Nico. That's it. That's all we're going to hear. But there is some interesting things behind the scenes going on. So Josiah dies and Jehoahaz, it says, was 23 years old when he replaced his father. But he wasn't the oldest son. He was younger than some of his other brothers. And yet he goes into position. Now, if you would, turn over with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 15. And here we're going to see uh, these names. Verse 15, the sons of Josiah were Johanan, the firstborn, which we don't read anything of him. And so it's assumed that he might have been killed at some point for some unknown reason that's not recorded. And the second was Jehoiakim. Now we're going to talk about Jehoiakim, but somehow Jehoahaz got in there before him. The third, Zedekiah. And the fourth, Shalom, which is also Jehoahaz. Okay, so... How did he get in there? Well, one of the things that we find out, if, if you look at verse 31, it says, Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king. He reigned three months in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hamudal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. Now, not our prophet Jeremiah. Remember, we just read a moment ago that he was from Anathoth. This was from Libna. Now, what does this have to do with anything? Well, there is a little speculation, but it's not, it's, it, it, it's not far-fetched. Um, l- l- there's hardly anything riddle, writ- riddle about Hamudal, <laughs> written about Hamudal, and Perhaps she was very instrumental in seeing that he became king. You know, in, in the books of First and Second Kings, we've seen mothers come in and jockey for position with their sons. We've even seen a mother jockey in position for her to be queen. So that wouldn't be out of the question. We've seen aggressive mothers. Um, but he had a different mother then Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim's mother's name was uh, Zebeb, Zeb, uh, Zebida, Zebida. 
So it's the same king, same father, but different mothers. Now there's one other idea that might be going on here because it says that the people put Jehoahaz in. Why would they do that? Well, it says that she was from Libna and a little bit of history in Libna. In fact, we'll turn there to 2 Kings 8.22. In 2 Kings 8.22, it talked about that the Edomites revolted against Judah and Libna, who was a part of Judah, joined them. It says, chapter 8, verse 22, so Edom revolted against Judah to this day. Then Libna revolted at the same time. The idea is that perhaps this was a political move uh, Libna, not too sure about where they stand, but in order to make sure that they're allies, we've got a perfect situation. You remember it was Solomon who was certainly, um, uh, he was the one that was marrying all of these women uh, so he could make all of these allies. So it's not the same, but there is a mother there who's from Libna. So one reason or another, he usurped his older brothers. Well, look at verse 32. It doesn't really matter much because he was evil. But then again, so were his brothers. But let's take a look at 2 Kings 23, 32. And here we see the familiar verses he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And by this time, we see that that has been used some 30 times in both 1 Kings and 2 Kings. It's, it's, it's really like a theme. Uh, but one of the themes that we don't see is according to all that his fathers had done. And of course, we're thinking of Josiah. And then if the father wasn't a good king, it would be according to all that David did. So what we find here is that he did evil. And of course, in the book of Kings, most of the time when it refers to evil, it's referring to idolatry. Now, believe me, that's not the only sin that they do. And we're going to actually get into a little detail of that. But the truth of the matter is that... Um, he did evil, and, and much of it was about idolatry. Well, we come to verse 33 then, and it says, Pharaoh Necho imprisoned him at Riblah in the land of Hamath, that he might not reign in Jerusalem. And he imposed on the land a fine of 100 talents of silver and a talent of gold. Well, why? What happened? Well, it doesn't exactly say what happened, but it is interesting. He obviously wanted gold and silver from Judah. Evidently, Jehoahaz didn't want to give any to Pharaoh Necho. So he, being Necho, he imprisoned Jehoahaz, and then he put this tax on Judah. And where it says that it was um, 100 talents of silver and a talent of gold, that would be 750 pounds of silver and seven and a half pounds of gold. And this was the taxation that was placed on uh, Judah. By the way, someone has once said, this is why the Jewish people didn't like kings over them, uh, foreign kings, if you will. And this is why they didn't like taxation because they had all of these kings the, of other nations that were coming over and uh, taxing them and, and their good, hard earned money had to go to a foreign king just to keep the wolf away from the door. Well, anyway, he is imprisoned as we see here. And um, we're, we're going to actually see him um, in, in Nico. We're going to see Nico involved with the next king, which is Jehoiakim. That's verse 34. 
Now, there's going to be one other comment about Jehoahaz in verse 34, so let me read it. Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah. Who is he? We didn't mention him. Eliakim is the same as Jehoiakim. Watch. He made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in the place of Josiah, his father, and changed his name to Jehoiakim. Then it says, but he took Jehoahaz away and brought him to Egypt and he died there. So because Jehoahaz didn't want to give taxes to Necho, what do you do? Well, instead of killing him, I suppose it was merciful, but he imprisoned him. Um, we, we have seen it already in the book of Kings where such imprisonment wasn't the worst thing in the world. Uh, we saw some of these kings being taken care of, but we don't know for sure, and you don't have to. Um, I can imagine that Nico wasn't too happy with Jehoahaz. But anyway, he, they, he finally took him from Riblah to Egypt, and he ended up at some point dying there. Well, let's get back to Jehoiakim now. Let's talk about Jehoiakim. Um, Somehow or other, there might have been some communication between, and I'm going to call him Jehoiakim. There's a communication, I think, I would imagine, between him and Nico. Because Nico picks him. Uh, now, he is the next in line in his age, but... I think he would have wanted to make sure, okay, look, I can see, I can set you up as king, but are you going to support me? Are you going to pay taxes? Are you going to pay tributary? And it looks as if that was part of the deal. And we'll, we'll see that in just a moment. Um, so he makes Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in place of Josiah. So we, we see that Jehoahaz is only in there for three months, and we're going to see Jehoiakim in there for quite a long time. And that could be why his name was mentioned in the beginning of Jeremiah. Now, look, if you would, at verse 35. See, we're moving along rather quickly here. Verse 35. So Jehoiakim gave the silver and gold to Pharaoh. But he taxed the land, he being Jehoiakim, his own people, taxed the land in order to give the money at the command of Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and gold from the people of the land, each according to his valuation, to give it to Pharaoh Necho. Now, I don't want to get into paying taxes or anything, but the Bible does say we are to give to Caesars what is Caesars. Even Jesus uh, uh, got a fish from Galilee, and there was a coin in his mouth and said, whose inscription is on it? And they said, Caesar. He said, give to Caesars what is Caesars, but give to God what is God's. Uh, also too, gosh, and I hope I don't get lynched here. The, the whole idea of taxation is not the worst thing in the world. Uh, we're, uh, we're thinking of, okay, where do we get the money to fix our roads? Where do we get the money to, to, to do um, renovation in the cities that we live in? Some of that comes or should come and should be spent on um, these kinds of things. So in that sense, it's not bad. Well, guess what happens? Um, well, you know, there's greedy people in there. There's, there's people who are going to scam. They're going to lie. They're going to cheat. They're going to keep the money. So that's what happens. But anyway, um, this doesn't seem good. They don't want to pay someone else. If they're going to pay taxes, at least help us build the wall around Jerusalem. Help us build the gates that are depleted. But no, it's going to Egypt with Pharaoh Necho. So we see Jehoiakim here, and we see that uh, he is indeed uh, in cahoots, at least for the time being, with Necho. Now, um, I want to mention something here, a little technical. Okay, so when we were looking at 1 Chronicles 3.15, 
Do you remember how it said third Zedekiah and then fourth Shalom or Jehoahaz? Even though it mentioned Jehoahaz last, Zedekiah was the youngest. We're going to find that out because when Zedekiah becomes king, we're going to say, oh my word, 11 years passed and he's still in his early 20s. Well, then why did First Chronicles order it that way? Um, well, first of all, because it doesn't say that it's ordering it in the way of chronology. Um, they ordered it, we believe, the author ordered it that way in, in who was going to be a main king. And we see Zedekiah, who's, who's going to be king longer than Shalom, no better than Shalom, but he's going to be a king longer. So his name was mentioned uh, before uh, Jehoiakim. And uh, Je I'm sorry, Jehoahaz. Uh, again, Johanan's name is not there, even though he's the firstborn and no one really knows. It, and so it's assumed that he died for w one reason or another. Um, all right, so let's look now at verse 36. Jehoiakim was 25 years old. Now you remember it said Jehoahaz was 23 years old. He only lasted three months. So within the same year, Jehoiakim was 25. So that was their age. Now we're going to find out later that Zedekiah, when he becomes king, he's in his 20s as well. So that means he's not in his 20s now. He's younger than. In fact, some have said that he's, he may have been like uh, the age of uh, 10 or something when Jehoahaz was king. It says, he became king and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Zebida, the daughter of Padiah of Rumah. So we do see this idea of different mothers. Same father, but different mothers. Well, what about him? Was he going to take after his father, Josiah? Not hardly. Verse 37, here we go again. He did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his fathers had done. So we see this mentioned once again. And we have a little bit of insight from Jeremiah. Jeremiah talks about Jehoiakim and not well at all. And he was guilty of the sin of idolatry and a whole a whole host of other sins as well. So I want to just take a moment here and look at Jeremiah, since Jeremiah is the prophet of this time, specifically with uh, these kings. Let's first turn to Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 19. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 19. It says, Behold, Listen, the cry of the daughter of my people from a distant land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not within her? Why have they provoked me with their graven images and foreign idols? Now, when it talks about where they are, that's a reference to they're in captivity. And Jeremiah is going to, Give that prophecy over and over and over. But notice it says, why have they provoked me with their graven images and foreign idols? That seems to be the big sin. Uh, chapter 9, verses 13 and through 16. I'll read that. You don't have to. The Lord said, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, nor walked according to it, but have walked after the stubbornness of their heart and after the bales as their fathers taught them. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will feed them, this people with wormwood, that's bitterness, and give them poison water to drink. I will scatter them among the nations whom neither they nor their fathers have known 
and I will send the sword after them until I have annihilated them. Now, again, when we read these things in Jeremiah, it isn't the first time or the first prophet that has said these things. Prophets have been saying these things. Even the scripture that God gave to Moses in Deuteronomy was saying these things. Even in the book of Exodus, these things are mentioned. Over and over and over, no one can question the long suffering of God. But be careful because it does and can come to an end. And then also in chapter 10, you don't have to turn there, but he will talk to them about idols in much the same, same way. He, I, I do like a little bit of the logic that he uses there. He's talking about these nations and their idols. He says, because it is wood cut from the forest, the work of the hands of a craftsman with a cutting tool. So it, it's so interesting. So interesting you have these idols that they went and chopped them down and then they crafted them. That's their God. They crafted their God. It says, they decorate it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers so that it will not totter. If it's a God, it shouldn't totter. But it's not a God. It's a false God. It says, like a scarecrow in a cucumber field are they. And they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. What kind of God is it that cannot walk? Do not fear them for they can do no harm, nor can they do any good. There is none like you, O Lord, Jeremiah says. You are great and great is your name in might. So that goes on. Uh, remember in Isaiah, I love what Isaiah says. He says, you, you chip away and you carve this idol and then you take the wood chips and you go cook burgers and you grill with it at night and you have your meal. That's from this, this supposed God. And yet they were plagued with idolatry. But Jeremiah spends quite a bit of time talking about Jehoiakim who committed other sins. And uh, some of them are mentioned as he was re represented as a monster who despoiled his own people. He opposed the Lord's servants, the prophets, and he filled the land with violence, apostasy, apostasy and degradation. So first of all, let me read from Jeremiah 22 through 13. It says, Woe to him who builds his house without righteousness and his upper rooms without justice who uses his neighbor's services without pay and does not give him wages. Let me just stop there. Well, we would have a problem with that in any generation. You know, you, you see people always upset of they, they do work, but they don't feel as if they're getting the pay that they deserve. And that, I mean, we've seen that in history. But do you remember Josiah? The first thing that he did when he started out was he took the money from the treasury and he called all these craftsmen and the money was there to pay them ahead of time. So we, we see this in the realm of justice. We see this in the realm of goodness on Josiah's part. But Jehoiakim, uh-uh. He, you know, he did take one lesson from his father. It says, he goes on to say, who says, I will build myself a roomy house with spacious upper rooms and cut out its windows, paneling it with cedar and painting it bright red. So in other words, he'll take care of himself, but not others. And that's always the cry that you hear in the world today. And we've, and we've heard this in the past where, you know, all they do is they're concerned about their own wealth and their own money. They don't care about the lesser common and poor people. So anyway, our generation, our history, recent history, is not the first to be guilty of that. But it says that he opposed the Lord's servants. 
And, and so there are a couple of things that we want to see there. Um, in Jeremiah 26, uh, tur- go ahead and turn there. And uh, those of you who have gone through Jeremiah with me, you may have remembered this. So what happens in a time when the king does not serve God and doesn't want to hear from God, but there is a prophet of God there? Well, it says, Jeremiah chapter 26, beginning in verse 20, Indeed, there was also a man who prophesied in the name of the Lord, Uriah, the son of Shemaiah, from kiriath Jerem. And he prophesied against this city and against this land, words similar to all those of Jeremiah. Now let's stop right there. This is kind of interesting. So the king had other false, had false prophets, other prophets who were false. And we see even in the book of Jeremiah that there was this battle that these false prophets were always saying, King, don't worry, nothing's going to happen. You're going to be okay. And Jeremiah saying, you got to repent. It's at the door. Well, here's another prophet, Uriah, and he's saying the same thing Jeremiah is. He's a true prophet. Now, watch what happens. When King Jehoiakim and all his mighty men and all the officials heard his words, then the king sought to put him to death. But Uriah heard it, and he was afraid, and fled and went to Egypt. Then King Jehoiakim sent men to Egypt, Elnathan, the son of Achbor, and certain men with him went into Egypt. And they brought Uriah from Egypt and led him to King Jehoiakim, who slew him with a sword and cast his body into the burial place of the common people. That's Jehoiakim. Now, Jeremiah is also a prophet at this time too. And God spares Jeremiah. But they wanted at times, these kings, these sons of Josiah wanted to kill him. They ended up putting him in a cistern where he probably would have rotted and died. But again, the Lord did not allow that. So this is, this is what's being said about him opposing the Lord's servants. Um, As for the violence uh, and apostasy, um, we read in Jeremiah 18, 18, then they said, come and let us devise plans against Jeremiah. Surely the law is not going to be lost to the priest, nor counsel to the sage, nor the divine word to the prophet, Come on and let us strike at him with our tongue and let us give no heed to any of his words. Do give heed to me, O Lord, and listen to what my opponents are saying. Should good be repaid with evil? For they have dug a pit for me. Remember how I stood before you to speak good on their behalf so as to turn away your wrath from them? Well, you actually have two things going on here. Here's still this violence and this apostasy and degradation. But we have seen in the book of Jeremiah where Jeremiah cries out to God, Lord, what's going on? Am I not serving you? In fact, we, we even see a time when Jeremiah is very discouraged and the Lord has to encourage him. But it was a tough encouragement. You know, it's a tough encouragement to look at this thing correctly and understand it from God's point of view. But anyway, we certainly see that going on. Well, this is the kind of evil that he did. And now we're going to move to chapter 24. And now we see the name Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar. So we're not going to really talk a lot about him now uh, because we will be seeing more of him and we will have plenty to say. But in his days, Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, came up and 
Jehoiakim became his servant for three years, and then he turned and rebelled against him. And we'll, let's stop there. So one writes, after the final defeat of the combined Assyrian and Egyptian forces at Carchemish, this is the second battle, Nebuchadnezzar overtook the remaining Egyptian forces at Hamath. So you remember how we said they were all jockeying and Assyria, who was the power, is losing power. Egypt is in there. Well, here comes Nebuchadnezzar and he's going to be the power and he's going to uh, be raised to a place. But he's also going to be the one who takes Judah into captivity. All right. So enough about that. All right, so for three years, he's serving him. But then after that, he rebels. Um, and then we find in verse two, look at this. The Lord sent against him. Okay, the Lord sent against him, Jehoiakim, bands of Chaldeans. That's Babylonians. Bands of Arameans. Bands of Moabites and bands of Ammonites. So he sent them against Judah to destroy it. According to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through his servants, the prophets. So what we're seeing here is two things. He's sending these nations to attack Jehoiakim because of Jehoiakim's sin. But we're also seeing that this is starting to ebb away at Judah. Now, they're going, the, Judah will be destroyed, but this is kind of like their, their bands. They're not full armies, but they're bands of them, and they're starting to peck away. And if you will, it's a warning. This is what the Lord said he was going to do through his prophets. And when it starts to happen, it ought to you know, affect them, but it does not. Um, I do want to mention something here because this, this is mentioned in Jeremiah. Notice he, it says there at the very end of verse two that he spoke through his servants, the prophets. Well, that could be a a lot of prophets, <laughs> all of the prophets, but just turn with me to Jeremiah 15, 6, 9, 6 through 9. Jeremiah 15, 6 through 9. It says in verse 6, You have forsaken me, declares the Lord. You keep going backward, not towards me, but backward, away from me. So I will stretch out my hand against you and destroy you. I am tired of relenting. Now, again, Jeremiah, though we know him as an emotional prophet, the weeping prophet, not a crybaby. Because why would they have wanted to kill him? Because he told him exactly the truth, what God said. Even when the false prophets were challenging him, he, he stood tall. And he was strong. And here we have him preaching this. And the other thing is, I hear it over and over and over and over and over again. And it just doesn't matter. God says, I am tired of relenting. So we see this. We see even at times God's emotion now, I, I believe that it is emotion, you, you know, where it says that uh, he regretted, you know, making man. I, I, I believe that that emotion would be there. But let's not look at it like us, because God knows all. And he knows that he's going, he has a plan. So even though the flood came, he didn't destroy everyone. And even though he's going to destroy his people, he has another plan and he's going to bring this all about. And that's the joy of the Lord. But the joy of the Lord also says, you know, this is terrible. This is my people. 
and they just refuse, refuse, refuse to listen, except for a few bright, godly people throughout their history. This is what has happened. And he says, I am tired of relenting. And of course, uh, I've shared with you before where he tells Jeremiah, stop, stop praying about this. I don't want to hear it. So God means business that they still don't repent. You know, I would think that if they repented, they probably could not turn the future there. It was going to happen anyway, but they could be like Josiah where God says, but for you in all the days of your life, you will have peace. But Judah's still getting it. <laughs> All right, let's read on. Verse 7, I will winnow them with a winnowing fork at the gates of the land. So that's where they're taking the wheat and they're th taking with a pitchfork and they throw it up in the air and the chaff gets blown away and the wheat comes down. And that's what he's doing. Uh, only in this case, he's, he's referring to them as the chaff, not the wheat. They're getting blown away. I will bereave them of children. I will destroy my people. They did not repent of their ways. Their widows will be more numerous before me than the sand of the seas. That's, that's an awful thing. That's an emotional thing. That's an awful thing with, be it war, be it some kind of calamity. Uh, men are killed and there's just widows and orphans. And it's, it's a terrible, terrible thing. I will bring against them, he's going to bring all these things, against the mother of a young man, a destroyer at noonday. I will suddenly bring down on her anguish and dismay. She who bore seven sons pines away. Her breathing is labored. There's no man. There's no husband. Her son has set while it was yet day. She has been shamed and humiliated. So I will give over their survivors to the sword before their enemies, declares the Lord. So this is what's being said here. And God is doing it by sending these nations, these other nations. And there's a number of other verses there, even from Habakkuk. Um, talks about these things and, and, and God says, look, I, I, I told you it was coming. Um, and then eventually it will be Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, I will have you turn at this. Uh, Jeremiah 25, chapter 8, verse 9, because this becomes a really big theme in the book of Jeremiah. Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. By the way, at some point in Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Daniel is over in Babylon. They didn't take all of the captives at once, but there were three deportations. And again, you would say, wait, wait, what? Yeah, so it happened once and they still didn't learn. And it happened again, and <laughs> they still didn't learn. And then there came the third and final deportation. They're all gone. But anyway, in the first deportation, Daniel is a part of that, and he's over in Babylon. Okay, it says, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord. I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant. My servant. And will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all these nations round about. And I will utterly destroy them and make them a horror and a hissing and an everlasting desolation. So, wow. And he calls Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar his servant because he's going to use him to bring about this punishment to his own people as well as other nations. And then we have verses 3 and 4. And guess whose name is going to be mentioned? Manasseh. Do not 
name your grandchild Manasseh. It says, verse 3, Surely at the command of the Lord it came upon Judah to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done. And also for the innocent blood which he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would not forgive. So again, Manasseh, even though there were many evil kings, uh, we could probably say just as bad or almost as bad as Manasseh. Manasseh was really bad. It was the camel, it was the straw that broke the camel's back and opened the door for God's wrath. And we, we see, uh, I have a number of verses there where Manasseh's name is mentioned over and over as he's the one who was the final straw. And then we have verse 5. Familiar? Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? And again, not talking about the book of Chronicles in the Bible, because if you go over to Chronicles, it doesn't, there, there isn't a whole lot more detail uh, than there is here in Kings. And we have some of these that it says that from these books, and there was nothing from Chronicles. So it's, we're talking about a royal document or a document that was kept like at the courthouse, that type of thing. Well, I want to just mention a couple things here. Uh, and we've kind of talked about this, but here it is again. It is a little bit of a conundrum, not a, not a contradiction. But you do remember that even Manasseh repented at the end. And there was some blessing, but Judah was still going to get it. We have these kings that there is no repentance. So even though Manasseh is the king or the straw that broke the camel's back, there's a sense in which he's better than these kings because he repented. Now, the conundrum is, that's the irony. The conundrum is that he gave personal forgiveness to Manasseh. But the sins that Manasseh committed were so grievous and influential to Judah that he would not forgive. So as we're looking at the sovereignty of God, the mind of God, the justice of God, there can be personal forgiveness, but the consequences of sin do not always go away. Let's, uh, let's take a look, first of all, at Manasseh's repentance. This is in 2 Chronicles. I'll just read it. 2 Chronicles 33, 12, and 13. You remember he was imprisoned. And there, while he was in prison, it says, when he was in distress, he entreated the Lord, his God, and humbled himself greatly before the God of fathers, his fathers. When he prayed to him, he was moved by his entreaty and heard his supplication. That's God. And brought him again to Jerusalem to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Now, you remember when we were going through that passage and the first thing we thought was, oh, yeah, right. You know, he's in prison and now he's going to get religion. Um, but it really seems as if it was very genuine with him. I mean, this verbiage sounds genuine. And then he, he went on a reform. He went on a reform. But again, he was also the guy who brought about the final breath of God's pronouncement of judgment. And it says here at, at the end of verse four, the Lord would not forgive. Well, let me kind of go through this. Now, first of all, let, let's apply it to us as believers. Um, I, not quite the magnitude, I think, as Manasseh and I'm not really sure that there's any 
straws on the camel's back that we will break as far as bringing in the wrath of God. But let's look at it. First of all, I'm going to think of a verse that I quote all the time because it's a, it's a wonderful verse, Romans 8, 1. So for every believer, everyone who believes that they're a sinner separated from God, that God so loved the world that he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. Every, every sinner who places his faith in Christ as his savior, and that alone is forgiven and given eternal life. And there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So it's not as if God's going to wait for us to slip up again and then we're going to hell. There is no condemnation. Why? Because condemnation had been poured out on Jesus Christ on the cross. And so that is so fantastic. And let's face it, we deserve it. We deserve to go to hell just as well as any other sinner who rejects Christ, except for the sake of God's grace and Christ who died on the cross for our sins. Now, from there we go, well, does God ever deal with the believer? Yes, yes. And we would call that heavenly discipline. So let's turn to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, let's look at verse 5. That whole chapter is really good, but we'll look at verse 5. We go to this passage when we talk about heavenly discipline. So I think heavenly discipline can be in two ways. One, I think if there's sin in a life and it's unrepented and God needs to get a hold of our lives, I believe, yes, there will be heavenly discipline. I think the other thing is, is it's not so much the discipline of sin. In other words, I'm looking at a second category. It's the discipline that we are trying to grow and be holy and mature, but we struggle with the sin nature. And that's got to be, that's got to be dealt with. And so we see God bringing things into our life that way. There would even be a third area, which has nothing to do with anything that we might have done wrong. It would be God is trying to conform us to the image of Christ. And that's what we would want. That's what we pray for. I have a feeling we're going to hear about that this Sunday because we're going to be doing the 2023 review. So the idea is, let's read it. Verse five, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. Remember that. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. So again, I mentioned those three areas. So one, it is for unrepentant sin. Number two, it's for maturity uh, and victory over sin. And number three, it's just to develop the character of Christ in us. Let's read on, verse 7. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Wow. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. So if we were going to try to apply these things that God says he will not forgive. And he's tired of relenting. How do, we, how do we figure that out? What, how do we apply that? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think that we can really apply it, uh, that God is, uh, you know, relenting. Uh, not, he's tired of relenting, although I, I, I imagine that could happen in some cases of believers. But God has forgiven them. He has, there's no condemnation, but there's going to be 
there or can be this heavenly discipline. And it sounds like we all get it one way or another. You get those things where like, hey, what, what, why is this happening? I didn't do anything wrong. Or at least we don't think we did. Maybe the discipline is to show us that we did. But I didn't do anything wrong. There are those cases. Well, neither did the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, we're, we're being made like him. We're being put in a situation that we can go, oh, so that's what it felt like when he went through that. Again, you may be hearing some of this uh, next Sunday, this Sunday or the next Sunday. But the final thing that I want to say is, however, let's talk about consequences. Now, I would say in all real, reality, you know, how many times has the Lord really intervened and spared us, you know, in life. I mean, spared us with our sins, no question. But even in life, have you ever been in those situations where, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this, you know? Um, either it was my fault or it's not my fault and I'm in it and I don't know how I'm going to get out of it. And he spares us so many times and answers our prayers. But that's not always the case. Sometimes because of our, con our, our, our sin, uh, especially with unrepentant sin, um, when we do repent, some of those consequences will linger on and they can be very grievous. So there's no guarantee uh, that, that because there's no condemnation, there's not going to be any consequences of our sins, either past or present, you know, either past or present. So anyway, um, I, I just thought that was a very, very interesting application to apply it to us. The other one is the Lord's sovereignty. We're going to talk about the Lord's sovereignty as he raises up Babylon. What's interesting is I'm, I have a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, but I've had some people ask me questions about, well, what we see today, are, uh, is, is it signs that it's going to happen soon? Uh, and the answer is no, not necessarily. Maybe, <laughs> but no, not necessarily. So someone asked me just the other day, what about that passage in scripture? It says brother against brother. Uh, and they're talking about that. Basically what you have from a verse like that is, first of all, it's just, it, it, first of all, it's in life, in the past and the present. And it can be getting worse as it gets closer, but it will be fulfilled, completely fulfilled in the tribulation. So how close are we? I, I don't know. But anyway, we see the sovereignty of God. Well, with all of these things, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and close. Father, thank you for these true events. Father, we are going through the book of Kings and we've even had to repeat applications. But Lord, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with it getting so ingrained in our minds, our heart, our soul that we don't forget it. And Father, we, we just ask you that, um, that really in our, our walk with you, we th that we'll continually thank you that there's no condemnation. Father, when we do go through hardship, heavenly discipline, may we not faint, but may we have it and take it as joy that we're being made like Christ. And oh, Father, we do ask that any consequences that linger, we would even ask that you would spare us from it, spare others from it, Lord. And yet at the same time, we know that you are wise and you are sovereign and you bring about your perfect will in our lives. We'll just thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So.